friends, I'm Dr. Sherry Warren, the Minister for Women's and Gender Justice at the National Ministries of the United Church of Christ. Thanks for joining us today for this episode of Engendering Spirit Education Series. Today's topic is about reproductive justice, and I have two well-known advocates in this topic area, as well as from the great state of Ohio, who are going to be explaining some things about repro justice or RJ as it is often called and sort of delineating it differently from other movements such as the reproductive rights movement or the reproductive freedom movement. They're all very much related but they all have a slightly different framework. Please do take a look at this study guide that was provided with this video to help you think through some questions, gather up some resources, and frame your con conversation within your congregation. Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Sherry Warren and you are at Engendering Spirit Education Series. I am the United Church of Christ's National Minister for Women's and Gender Justice. And today I am so excited to have people with me who are doing outstanding work in our community. Today, I have Nicole Marino, who is the field or Ohio field organizer for Catholics for Choice. And I have Reverend Terry Williams with us, who is a faith organizer with Faith Choice Ohio. He also is the minister at Orchard Hill United Church of Christ in Chillicothe, Ohio. Thank you both for being here. We're here to talk today about reproductive justice in Ohio and beyond. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you two to talk a little bit about what do we mean when we say reproductive justice. Yeah, thank you for having us. Appreciate it so much. Um, I know that Reverend Terry and I are both chatters and happy to go back and forth and share as much information. I think one of the most important things when talking about or introducing reproductive justice is to give credit where credit is majorly due. Um, this idea or definition, which is to parent, not parent, um, have children, not have children, and be able to have those children in a safe and sustainable community is from Sister Song. Um, and that was developed by a group of fabulous, amazing Black women. And that needs to be recognized, especially when talking about reproductive justice and this idea that came from 1994 and this group of women. So being able to make sure that we're giving that context as well, that this idea that a lot of Black women were excluded from the conversation for a very long time. And that needs to be recognized. I know that Reverend Terry also has um, some really great context about reproductive justice a little bit even deeper as well. Absolutely, thanks, Nicole. You know, when, when we hear the phrase reproductive justice, um, I know as a minister in the United Church of Christ, sometimes um, we hear RJ, which is our short term for reproductive justice, we hear reproductive justice used um, almost as an alternative or a catch-all um, umbrella term. And we at Faith Choice Ohio, and I know Catholics for Choice, also really try to avoid that kind of conflation because RJ is a very specific and rich stream of tradition um, we talk about streams of tradition in the UCC uh, so often, and that stream of tradition does come, like Nicole said, from this 1994 gathering of the minds and hearts and spirits of Black women. Um, there was a, a large number of Black women who had participated in the International Conference on Population and Development in Cairo, in Egypt, and they had returned and gathered in Chicago and really had this moment of voicing aloud that their experience as Black women wasn't being reflected in the majority white cultural movement of abortion rights. That, yes, the right to have an abortion, the right to access an abortion is important, but their lives were demanding so much more than simply that right around this one procedure and this one concept. For them, again, just to restate um, what Nicole said, um, it's important to have bodily autonomy and the right to have children, the right to not have children, and the right to nurture the children that you do have in safe and sustainable communities. And particularly for those of us of religious values in the last several years in particular, 
we have understood that last portion in much deeper relief. And the reality is Black women have always understood that nurturing children in a safe and sustainable environment, that is the goal. That is like, that is the gold standard for reproductive health rights and justice, living a life of reproductive vibrancy and verdancy. Um, we see so often with the mistreatment and the maltreatment of people of color in our nation, the inability for many communities of color to simply live and to simply be, we see the essential nature of RJ. So the work that we do is rooted in that larger framework to say, this is about abortion. Yes, we don't shy away from abortion. And it's about so much more. Abortion is one part of that wider vibrancy, that wider abundant living that comes from being able to choose to have children, choose to not have children, and parent the children that you do have in safe and sustainable communities. Thank you both. And so well said. I am curious, uh, you say abortion so boldly. And I know that it is a word that can inflame and that people try to skirt it, dance around it at times because it it is so clear what is meant. What do you recommend for folks who might be struggling to actually say that word? few things that Reverend and I, Terry, and I talk about when we're on our faith and repro freedom tour um, that we're taking all throughout Ohio and kind of focusing on this moral messaging, right? And a, a very popular term when folks are having this conversation about abortion is, you know, I'm pro-choice, but I, I would never get an abortion. And something that Reverend Terry and I have talked about is then what are what are you for? When we talk about this idea of safe choice, aren't you for someone having access to that abortion in itself? And that we're re-stigmatizing this idea of abortion when we're not saying the word out loud, right? It is healthcare. It is essential healthcare that everyone deserves. And in not using that word and not saying abortion and tiptoeing around it, we are causing so much more harm. And I think that's one thing to really kind of break through with people is that abortion is essential health care, period. Amen. Thank, thank, amen. A big amen. <laughs> amen. Thank you, Nicole. And before I turn it over to Terry, and I hope I don't just like slide in and steal your thunder, uh, I want to make it very clear at this last general synod, synod that the United Church of Christ had, in Indianapolis, we passed a resolution almost unanimously declaring abortion as health care within the United Church of Christ. So we have a uh, community backed and mandated stances on this particular issue. So sorry if I took that from you, Terry. No, I just want to add an amen and hallelujah, because I, I was able to be there at General Synod. Some of you might recognize me as the uh, General Synod uh, table parliamentarian. I was the stage parliamentarian. But um, in that work, listening to the dialogue that our church was able to have, our church didn't just come to this lightly or lately, right? Uh, we've had generations of forebears in the UCC and other denominations, both Christian denominations and other faith traditions that in this nation have advocated for abortion as health care for a long, long while. Um, our organization grows out of one of those ministries, uh, the Clergy Consultation Service on Abortion, that was active pre-Roe versus Wade, that helped individuals who were seeking abortion care access that care. And when you ask me, well, you know, why do you why do you say the word abortion? How how do you say that so proudly? What do you say to people who are worried about using that? I remind people that our forebears were confronted in their pews, in their parishes, in their offices with the results of stigma. They were faced with people who felt deep shame and deep fear in a society that criminalized their ability to care for themselves and to make their own reproductive decisions. They had to meet those individuals amid the stigma and this overwhelming societal zeitgeist, right? And they said, in the core of that pastoral relationship, this is not right. This is not just. This is not holy to force these individuals to be 
isolated and to be silenced and to limit mm -hmm. their ability to make their own decisions. And our forebearers said, I will stand for these individuals and assist them and help them and do everything I can to help them get access to that care. And they did by the thousands, allowing that care to be provided, even in places where it wasn't legal. So when I hear somebody say, I don't know if I want to use that word. I don't know if, you know, I don't want to say I'm pro-abortion. I remind them that being pro-abortion and being clear about our values makes us less susceptible to reverting to that kind of unacceptable, horrendous regression. Because for me, I am pro-choice because of my faith. I am pro-abortion because of my faith. I believe every person is gifted with gifts to share and that they're the expert in their own bodies and what their own bodies need. That's at the root of the abortion advocacy that I do. And for me as a parish pastor, 10 years of ministry in a local church of the United Church of Christ, that pastoral root is the root of my expression. People ask me all the time, why are, why are you so bold about this? Why is this what you talk about all the time? It's because I carry with me those conversations and those dialogues of a decade of pastoral work with people who feel abandoned. They feel like they are the least, the last, and the left out because they are in a society that's trying, again, to criminalize their decision-making. And we in this community, we say, no, God trusts you. God loves you. We do too. And I think that that idea of criminalization of abortion, this is new. This is not something that has been around forever, as a lot of arguments are led to believe. And one thing that I just wanted to be able to share is a lot of the research that Catholics for Choice is able to share is that one in four abortion patients is a Catholic. We're not going anywhere. We're all here. And majority of Catholics do believe that abortion should be legal. But we're led to believe that this has been this ingrained idea that we're supposed to shame abortion when that is just not the case. This is all new. This is a very new conversation. Well, Nicole, I'm sure I've probably got some listeners and watchers right now who are going Catholics for choice. What? Who? Could you say a little bit more about what Catholics for choice stands for and the social, social teachings that support your work? Absolutely. And a lot of the time people hear Catholics for choice or pro-choice Catholicism and believe it to be this oxymoron or that these two words absolutely do not go together. And that's exactly what Catholics for choice is here to do. They work to encounter, educate and embold, embold pro-choice Catholics throughout the entire country. And I'm here to do it specifically in the Ohio area in support of issue one for the election. So what Catholics for Choice is here to do is to educate and encounter and embold pro-choice Catholics throughout the entire country. I'm here to find those pro-choice Catholics here in Ohio because we are the majority. The pro-choice Catholics, we are the majority. There are 17 million Catholics throughout the entire country and only 274 active US bishops. One thing that Catholics for Choice really loves to talk about and promote is that there is no way that 274 men are able to represent 17 million different political and social values. There's, there's just no way. And that we as Catholics for Choice are trying to embolden this group and make sure that other Catholics or pro-choice people know that faith does need to be a part of that conversation that does include the Catholic Church and the Catholic people because the lay Catholic people are tired of having this hierarchical system that is not representing them. And a lot of what Catholic for Choice does is brings this research to the forefront, takes Catholic social teaching, good Catholic social teaching that brings in your conscience, religious freedom, and social justice. And that's why, again, we care about abortion access because it's part of our faith that folks need health care that's going to support them to be the best person they can be. And only you know what's best for you. When Reverend Terry talks about bodily autonomy, that's your conscience. You know exactly what's best for you and your body, and only you can decide that. That conscience is your final arbiter in decision-making, and that makes you the best decision-maker. You have that free will. You have choice to make the best decisions for you. And that's really what a lot of Catholics for Choice is doing here. I almost feel like I want some sort of little graphic that I can click that like drops a mic oh. or like yeah. pounds, pounds on the pulpit. 
And, yes. and let me tell you, Sherry, when when we are we're going around right now in the state of Ohio with the Faith and Reproductive uh, Freedom Tour, myself and Nicole, when Nicole in person drops this, you know, the, this this bold proclamation and the statement of guess what? We're not the minority. We are the majority. Look at all these people who think just like you do we've we've had to create extra space in the presentation because it resonates so heavily with people who either are catholic or who were raised catholic which is a very large number of folks that they are moved to respond in that space um in in our beloved united church of christ um uh, 40% of newcomers give or take um to united church of christ congregations over the past decade were raised in the catholic church so we have within our ranks in the United Church of Christ and within many other denominations in Protestant Christianity, a lot of people who were raised with Catholic social teaching, and it's that Catholic social teaching of Catholic social justice, the care for social welfare, the compassion for those who are least and left out in the community, that is the root of their ideology and their religion. And it's not being reflected in the priorities of the hierarchy. I know here in Ohio, we have, uh, you know, a very clear movement among the hierarchy to use and leverage those congregations in the Roman Catholic Church to advance a position on the ballot initiative. And that we have seen across the nation, no matter where you are, there's a level to which this particular issue has drawn political participation Again, not not partisan candidate participation, because that's illegal under the IRS rules, but issues based advocacy from the Catholic Church in opposition to values of bodily autonomy and values of abortion access. And for those of us in religious traditions that usually try to keep our churches out of the political sphere or out of um, that kind of advocacy, we're calling for people to say, you know what, your congregation can stand up and be public about your values. You do not have to engage, you know, partisan candidate politics because that's, you know, not allowable. But as a 501c3 organization, as the United Church of Christ or any other denominational entity, you can stand up and say, our congregation believes that people should have access to the full spectrum of reproductive care, including safe and legal abortion." We believe in abortion seekers and being able to claim that and to own that, it is a powerful witness, just like Nicole's voice in um, a, a lot of our work in this state, being able to hear that just to hear for once that voice claimed and named in public space is powerful. I, I want to, if, if I can, I want to kind of ask Nicole uh, a softy uh, question here, because Nicole, you had such a wonderful um, experience at one of our, our recent uh, uh, tour stops, where you got to be in conversation with folks who asked you the following question. They said, is it okay for us to disagree with mm. with our church with the hierarchy in the church. And as a congregationalist, you all know, like we have our opinions about whether it's okay to disagree with your church, just to hint, it's always okay for congregationalists, right? <laughs> there was this genuine question from, from folks in other traditions, like, is it even okay to disagree with your church? And I loved your answer. And I would love for you to share that in, in this space. Yeah. And I hope I remember it perfectly. I, Specifically, I remember myself and Reverend Terry looking at each other and just going, yes, at one point in my Catholic social teaching, and I, again, have very, you know, personal experiences with being raised as a Catholic, but that was one thing I know and remember being taught, that you are allowed to question your faith, and it is encouraged to ask questions and know, you know what, this is not what I think I believe. I want to know more about it and have that space to hold those questions. And one thing so much so that we're able to kind of question our faith and question those hierarchical leaders, our executive director, Jamie Manson, is at the Vatican right now. She is still at the Vatican sharing abortion stories and going against the tippy top of the hierarchical leadership and holding that space to say, we as Catholic people 
don't agree with what is happening. We need to be more supported. There's so many articles that have been written about Jamie and her trip to the Vatican and in Italy. Um, it's all across news. If folks want to be able to read more about what she's doing, she brought tons of personal abortion stories to share directly. So if anything, we have executive directors going all the way to the Vatican to be able to ask those questions and raise those questions. I was actually at that tour stop specifically when that question got asked and I was like, oh, I can't wait for her to answer this. This is going to be a good one. Um, Always good. And I hope that was what you were referencing with um, Jamie Vanson going to the Vatican because it's incredibly cool and she's still there and has done amazing, amazing work. Um, and I'm, again, so incredibly proud to be able to work for an organization that does that kind of research and brings up these questions and allows room for conversation when a lot of us have felt like we can't have that conversation. But Catholic for Choice is creating this extremely needed space that has been ingrained in Catholic social teaching. We are absolutely allowed to ask questions about our faith. Thank you for bringing that up, Terry, so that Nicole could share that. Uh, you were talking about our own congregations and that we can get involved in advocacy around issues as long as we do not cross over into supporting any specific political candidates. I know I hear this from a lot of folks in nonprofits as well as uh, stretching that to include the congregational world. People are scared to get involved in things because they don't know where that line is. I'd like if you could, just for an example, bring up what exciting thing that you are getting involved in this Saturday. Even Stop. though this recording will probably not be available till folks till after it, but it's a great example. Absolutely. So this Saturday, um, we received an invitation some time ago at Faith Choice Ohio to come and participate in a reproductive justice rally at Bainbridge Community United Church of Christ. Um, they are a fantastic congregation up in Northeast Ohio doing this work doing this advocacy and placing before their community their values, their proud, bold, pro-choice values to say, guess what? General Synod has spoken many times. General Synod has encouraged us to you know, take these positions and advocate in the ways that we feel we are being called by our still speaking God to present this to the world. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to invite speakers from all around to come and address our community. And then afterwards, we're having a tour stop for the educational tour with Faith Choice Ohio. So being able to call your community in to say, guess what? We want you to know not every religious and faith voice is on the side that you think of when you think of religion and abortion. The very loud minority is very loud and they are a minority. We're going to raise our voices as well. We're going to raise our voices and say, that's not us. That's not who we are. And these are our values. We're going to present around issues of bodily autonomy, around equity, around racial and economic justice, around LGBTQ justice, the conversation of intersectionality that is so key to every justice movement finding success. That's where our values are coming. So again, Bainbridge Community United Church of Christ, I'm sure it will not be their last rally, but they are taking a bold stance and making a bold, straightforward view known in their community to say, guess what? We stand for people who are in our community making reproductive decisions, we trust them, we value them. That's fantastic. Uh, I know that your tour of Ohio is partially to raise awareness and educate people about issue one, which is coming up on the ballot in our November 7th, 7th, do I have the day right? Yes. Our election next month. I'm still so new to Ohio. I'm 26 a days away from recording date. So <laughs> <laughs> not that we're counting, but we're counting, right? <laughs> and this will get out before election day. Yeah. Uh, what can, can you mention what issue one is about just a little bit and um, maybe talk a little bit about the the organized plan behind the language of issue one and 
even the language about how we got to issue one and got it on the ballot. Absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead, Reverend Terry. I'll I'll just give the overview of what's in the amendment and then I'll I'll pitch it to Nicole. So the amendment that is before us has come because we had the disastrous Dobbs Supreme Court decision last year on the 24th of June. We then in the state of Ohio had 82 days. We count because every day counts. We had 82 days of the implementation of the six week abortion ban. That was, for all intents and purposes, a near total abortion ban in the state of Ohio. People suffered. We were under tremendous pressure to help people get access. Congregations across our state had to scramble to help support the 20,000 abortion seekers annually that need abortions in the state. We got to a point where we recognized as a movement, we need to change the state constitution to restore the rights that we had and to protect access to rights that we do currently have, but are under threat. So mm -hmm. this amendment came forward, not simply to restore just the rights to abortion, but the right to abortion, the right to contraception, the right to fertility treatment the right to miscarriage management, and the right to continue one's own pregnancy, which people are like, what does that even sound like? In our state, all of those elements from contraception to abortion, all of those elements are under some kind of threat right now. This amendment that's being proposed had to go through a stringent process. It had to go through a wearisome signature collection process. We were out for months getting these signatures to be able to put this on the ballot and let Ohioans decide, do you want to have control over your own reproductive decisions over all of these things, or do you want the government to control your body? And now on the 7th of November, or sooner because you can early vote in Ohio, folk will have the chance to have their voice heard. And we, of course, are urging a yes vote because all of those things are so critically important to us. I, I want to throw it over to Nicole in terms of, you know, this amendment has wide ranging implications. And there are lots of reasons to vote for this amendment. There are lots and lots and lots of things that get us where we need to go in this amendment. So Nicole, can you can you share a bit? And I think the most important thing really just to stress for folks in, in terms of that voting is it's a state constitution that we are trying to implement this amendment. That is simply all it is. And if you're reading through and there's a great read the amendment um, website where you can learn more about it, where it's talking about the right to protections of health and safety period. Amen. Again, that's all it really is. We want to be sure that we are protecting that right to privacy. It is a decision between a doctor and you. Without this amendment and passing of issue one, that six-week abortion ban is eminent. It is right there, ready to go, unfortunately. So we are in this place where we are drastically trying to get people organized and together to ensure this amendment is passed for that protection, for that six-week abortion ban not to be implemented again. And that's a huge piece of it. A lot of the time when we're having conversation one of the biggest pieces is, again, this idea of birth control, where, again, you know, Catholics and maybe people have been told birth control is also something that's a contentious issue and having conversations around it. 98% of Catholics have used birth control at one point in their life. And that is well over the majority. That's 98% of Catholics. And that's a huge piece that, again, is going to be protected within this amendment, not necessarily promoting it and throwing it around, but that it's protected. There cannot be anyone going after your access to abortion or that access to birth control. And these are, again, huge pieces that we want instilled in our constitution so no one is able to take those rights away from you. It's not just the access to get it, but that is your right. You again have a conscience. That is your decision. You know exactly what you need to do. No one else is there to tell you otherwise. And that's why this issue is so, so important and there's so much to it. And even though the amendment seems very long, there's so much into it, but it's so important and strategic that we need to be able to have these protections and have this reproductive freedom in Ohio finally instilled. 
Thank you. Uh, one of the things I want to make sure I point out to viewers is that all of the things that we've been talking about, read the amendment, um, the clergy consultation service, Faith Choice Ohio, Catholics for Choice, all of these things are going to be available to you viewers on the study guide as resources to follow up with and more places to go check out and learn. So don't worry that you are not capturing all of these. They are going to be captured for you. That is outstanding. I, I do want to mention, in addition, some people have heard a lot of misinformation about this ballot initiative because the whole strategy of anyone who has ever opposed reproductive health rights or justice in our history, people who oppose those rights, do it through confusion and misinformation, bar none, again and again and again. We have heard canards and red herrings thrown up about parental rights and about, oh, this will you know impact people's ability to um, you know be able to make decisions about their own reproductive care because someone else's reproductive care might be conflicting with that. All of these things are really set up to try to confuse and malign that very simple amendment. The amendment's one page, right? Readtheamendment.com, also readtheamendment.org, you know, whichever you put in, um, gives you the whole amendment, the entire amendment. It gives you those five elements that I mentioned previously. It also gives you the exact language for the viability language. And people have asked us, why, if you are for abortion all the time, anytime, every time, no matter what, like the other side has said you are, why is there a viability restriction here? Hey, here's the fun part. If you read the amendment for yourself at readtheamendment.com, you can see that the state is still permitted under this amendment to restrict abortion after fetal viability. And fetal viability is no longer defined by some politician who has no medical background and an ax to grind. It will be defined by medical doctors. The treating physician defines what is a viable pregnancy. And that treating physician then is held to account under state law for what happens to a viable pregnancy. That is, believe it or not, in the amendment. Folk don't want you to know that that is in the amendment. They just want you to be confused and feel anxious about what is coming. The reality is we think medical people ought to make medical decisions and pregnant people ought to make pregnant people decisions. And your legislator should not be called into the room to make decisions for you without your consent and without mm -hmm. your invitation. I have been with literally hundreds of individuals making reproductive decisions of all kinds. And I can tell you, some people have asked for their mother, some have asked for their father, some have asked for their sister, their brother, their hairdresser, their best friend from high school. Some have asked for their dog or their cat to be brought in. Not a single person has ever asked me, hey, can you get our state legislator in here? Because I'd really like to talk to them about my reproductive decisions. But yet we're in a place where our state legislators are the ones right in the room making decisions for people without any knowledge about their background. That's what this amendment takes away. And that's what it puts back into the hands of the individual. It gives that bodily autonomy back and says the Constitution will now protect your right to bodily autonomy. So a vote yes on issue one in Ohio is a vote for? Bodily autonomy, access to birth control, access to miscarriage management care, access to fertility treatment, access to continuing your own pregnancy, and access to safe and legal abortion. Amen. Boom. One of the Catholics of Choice, uh, their favorite saying is doctors, not doctrine. And we Ooh. have lots of posters and that. Um, <laughs> and some, again, very good information that we're able to share. And, you know, may I say this also is a vote for religious freedom. This is a huge conversation. There should not be one religion that is pushing views on someone else. This is empowering so many people in this simple, amazing amendment. So I am curious. So we've got Faith Choice Ohio, a multi-faith, interfaith supported organization doing some of this work in the state. We've got Catholics for Choice working on this. 
Um, I'm not sure if you've got other folks who are on your tour with you at certain times. Uh, I'm kind of curious who else in the the world of organized faith community is working on this with you. And I'm only going to ask you to speak to what's going on in Ohio at this moment. Although soon we're going to move beyond that. We have some folks that we're partnering with. Um, we have a panel with Red Wine and Blue coming up um, on the 23rd. We also have a event with one of our amazing Catholics for Choice advocates, uh, Gabrielle Winnell, who wrote a fabulous Columbus op-ed on the 18th with the Steel Valley Reproductive Freedom Coalition. Um, we're really working with um, the OURR, the Ohioans Unite for Reproductive Rights, which is the large coalition that's implementing this issue in this amendment. Um, we're working with anybody that is for issue one, and we are on their team. And a lot of people in the faith community and the political community are joining together to make sure this issue passes because a lot of these organizations recognize the importance of this. So we do have some other events um, going on that we're trying to promote as best as possible, mainly because there's some organizations or places and spaces that have never had the conversation or that intersection of faith in abortion access conversation before. And that's really what a lot of the time we're trying to do and break down that stereotype that Catholics are pushing against issue one and making sure that we're debunking those myths of Catholicism. Absolutely. And just real quick to add, like you asked for organizational partners, um, we work with our Jewish kin who are just remarkable advocates for reproductive health rights and justice and reproductive freedom. And when it comes to Ohioans United for Reproductive Rights, you can check out at ourr.win. Uh, you can check out, that's W-I-N at the end. Um, you can check out the endorsements of all the separate organizations. But I just want to lift up Bend the Ark Jewish Action Ohio is a fantastic organization that has joined us in addition to Catholics for Choice and Faith Choice Ohio. Also, Faith and Public Life has signed on and is doing a tremendous amount of work. Um, Freedom Block, which is not explicitly a religious organization, but I call them a religious organization because my, my good friend, uh, Reverend Raymond Green, is their leader, and they lead from a position of faith and values. They're they are involved. Greater Cincinnati Board of Rabbis, uh, very active as well, um, Jewish Community Relations Center of Cincinnati, um, fantastic groups. The Heartland Conference of the United Church of Christ and the wider United Church of Christ are partners in this. Heartland Conference UCC, which used to be the Ohio Conference of the United Church of Christ, but we, we changed our name here a couple years ago because we include congregations in West Virginia and uh, Northern Kentucky. The Heartland Conference signed on because it is our faith and because it is part of who we are. Um, in addition, uh, Jewish Action Coalition and the Religious Action Coalition of Reform Judaism are all parts of this work. And um, I'm sure I have forgotten someone uh, amidst all of the, oh, Unitarian Universalist Justice Ohio. That's right. <laughs> you, Joe. Oh, gosh. I can't forget you, Joe. We have so many partners and we are so like active right now in this campaign that trying to remember them all together is really um, it's a it's a lovely problem to have to have too many friends at the party, right? It's mm -hmm. like uh, it's like the joyous uh, front porch of the kingdom of God, right? That everybody is here, everybody is moving together, and 26 days from now we are going to see the fruits of that labor. Um, but again, all of these organizations, all of these groups, really moving as one toward this end, toward this goal of reproductive freedom for Ohioans. I and I it. think that shows how much we want to support issue one. And there was a recent study that was done that 58% of Ohioans believe that abortion should be legal. We are there. We have the organizations that are pro-abortion. We have the people that are pro-abortion. We just need to be able to make sure people are organized and going out and voting and showing that proof is the biggest piece. We're already there. We have the research. We have the people. We just need to go and vote. Mm -hmm. And what percentage is a pass? about 50%. We did we beat that in August. <laughs> That's right. There was some legislation in Ohio in August that tried to make that a more difficult to attain goal. 
So we've talked a lot about Ohio. Your work for both of you is centered around Ohio. And I want to make sure that people who aren't in Ohio understand how they also can take a stand about this work. What do you recommend for folks who who aren't in Ohio voting on issue one or who aren't in a state where this is on their upcoming ballot? Um, maybe they're in a state that it, it would be anathema to even consider that this would ever be a right that is taken away. Um, how can those folks help? There's a few options. Um, donating can be a huge piece. There are four abortion funds in Ohio that are always really great to support, uh, as well as independent clinics in the Ohio area. Something else just to even learn more is that Catholics for Choice is a national organization. We have the I am a Catholic for Choice pledge that can get you more information as well as more educational or programming tools, um, as well as our Advocates Bible study. Um, I'm actually surprised that Reverend Terry and I have not cited the Advocates Bible quite yet. We are two huge fans. Every one of my family members will be getting a copy for Christmas. Um, we have an Advocates Bible study that started on October 19th. This really goes into that Catholic social teaching and the idea of social justice and ties into it and how to get into this moral messaging. And while folks may be in a state that has this major uh, support, which is amazing, or maybe is in a state that does need some help, having a conversation with a family or community member or friend is huge and wildly impactful. And I think being able to understand that historical context of abortion access, especially around religion, is a major piece to be able to continue those conversations. And even though we are in states where maybe abortion is legal, that doesn't necessarily mean it's always accessible. And I think that's a really big piece for people to understand and making sure how are we supporting others when they do have an abortion? How am I not stigmatizing? Maybe I am stigmatizing and creating shame when I don't even know so. So continuing those conversations and donating money are the two biggest pieces um, that I think. And Cherry, I know that you have that link to the Advocates Bible Study as well as um, our Pledge for Catholics for Choice. And even exploring the website, we have fabulous um fabulous resources. And we have an amazing podcast with Faith Choice Ohio that Reverend Terry is able to help with it with Kelly Fox. Thank you so much, Nicole. And, well, and I can speak to how wonderful the Catholics for Choice Bible study is and how enlightening it was. I can also speak to Faith Choice Ohio's amazing training, some of which I have taken more than once, simply because some of these issues change so rapidly. Um, what do you what do you recommend, Reverend yeah. Terry? They do change rapidly. And, you know, I, I lift up everything that Nicole has said, particularly Advocates Bible Study. Having that as a resource is fantastic. Um, our podcast, um, great resource to get people engaged. It's called the Our Soul Podcast with Faith Choice Ohio. Um, I, I always start with people who are outside of Ohio who say, how can we help? My first thing that I ask you to do as a person of faith, whatever your prayer tradition is, whatever your good vibe tradition is, whatever your centering spiritual grounding tradition is, do that and do that a lot because we need spiritually grounded people engaged and empathetically open to the world to meet this moment. Right now in this nation, we have 15 states where abortion is completely banned. That's the starting point for like total ban. We are surrounded on three sides in this state, West Virginia, Kentucky, Indiana, with this most extreme ban and lack of access. So for us in Ohio, we need people to be aware of the emergency of this moment. And regardless of what state you're in, regardless of where you are, you have the ability, if you stay grounded, and if you stay united, and if you stay within a place and a headspace and a heart space where you can continue to be tender and empathetic and loving and open to change this world and make it better. My big ask in this place is if you are in a state where abortion is super solid, where you are not worried at all about what the future looks like, please, please, please get your resources to places that don't have that privilege. Get your resources to places that are trying to make a difference. If you are in a state 
that is adjacent to a state that has additional abortion restrictions, which is pretty much every state, right? Every state can find a state that has um, slightly different laws at this point. Find out who is doing the transportation work, what we call the practical support work, right? Lodging, rides to clinics, child care, money for lost wage offset. All of this work is work that's being done by abortion funds. You do not have to recreate the wheel. You do not have to be the salvation figure in this story. There are already people doing this work. Help them, help fund them, help fundraise for them, help raise awareness of what they're doing. For those of us here in Ohio, there are four abortion funds in Ohio. I participate in the Jubilee Fund, which is run through Faith Choice Ohio. We're a practical support fund. Those 82 days of the total abortion ban, that six-week abortion ban that we experienced, we helped people get from Ohio to other states and through Ohio to abortion access points. We got people to Chicago. We got people to New York. We got people to our dear friends in New Mexico with New Mexico Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. You have the ability to tap into networks that are already active and already helping people. The second thing that I would say, in addition to, you know, once you once you've got yourself prayed up and you get tapped into the people already doing the work, take that witness to your faith community. Stand up and pray for abortion seekers. Ask your local board to be direct about these things. Invite people from your conference, your association, the national church, Dr. Sherry Warren, right? Invite people into these spaces to have this dialogue more broadly, because we as a movement and as a people of faith need to be engaged in this work for the long haul. We did not get here in five years, 10 years, 12 years. It took 49 years of steady, dedicated anti-abortion advocacy to see the toppling of Roe versus Wade. If we're going to see a new horizon, it's going to take decades of hard work. So drink your water, take your vitamins, do your stretches, get ready, because this is the marathon for the moment that we are in. And we are called by the faith that lives within us to not allow this to rest until justice is the word of the land. That's where we are in this moment. I could go on forever about ways to engage, but just know no matter who you are or how much time and energy and effort you have to spare, there is a place in the movement for you. Your puzzle piece fits perfectly somewhere with somebody who is praying right now to God for you to come and fill that void and to bring joy in the morning. You have the ability to do that no matter what your gift is. It is a gift that you're gifted with to share. Share your gifts. Here ends the sermon. <laughs> Thank you both so much for your ministering around this topic, for your sharing your ministries with folks who are going to be able to access this, um, view this for a great deal of time and create meaningful conversations within their communities around this. Um, you may notice that I'm wearing my UCC Love is Louder t-shirt today. No accident. I want us to continually preach the notion that every, every human is worthy and beloved mm. and that we must be loving louder. Yes. Amen. 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 Thank you, dear friends. Thank you. My enormous thanks to both of my guests today, Nicole and Reverend Terry. If you don't know by now, issue one passed on November 7th in Ohio, and we are absolutely thrilled. And even though some of the focus of today's video was about Ohio, we tried to have conversation that could be broadened to the entire United States spectrum of reproductive justice concerns and legislative agendas. Please do check out the resources. And as you have conversation about this topic, remember to hold each other gently, friend. God loves us all. Amen.